Hello and welcome to Season 25 of the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. Thanks for all the emails of encouragement to continue that I've received in the interim since Season 24. And on that note, I'd like to share with you an update and vision for our podcast going forward. Angus and I have been doing this podcast now for the last 12 years. If you've been with us since the beginning, then you'll have been listening to us for that long too. And a huge thanks if you have. Originally, when we started out, we just wanted to give podcasting a go and see if anyone actually wanted to listen. Now, after the 12 years I mentioned and around 9 million downloads, we're wondering what to do with it. It never made us any money and barely covered its costs, and we're certainly not looking to get rich out of it at all. But since those fancy-free days of 12 years ago, a lot of changes have happened, and responsibilities been added in both Angus's and my life, and it's become more difficult to justify finding the time to produce the podcast. We also have contributors now who write episodes for us, thanks to all of you, and it would be great to be able to financially reward them a little for their time and effort. So what does this mean? Well, it means we're going to give the Patreon route a go. If you haven't heard of Patreon, it's like a way of micro-sponsoring each episode we release, and you never pay anything up front. What you do is you go to our Patreon page, pledge an amount you'd like to tip us with per episode, and only when we do actually release a new episode do we get the tip that you pledged. You can also set monthly limits, so if for some reason we had a bit of a spurt on and released a few extra episodes in a month rather than the regular two, then you'd never go over your monthly limit. It really is simple, and rather than us asking you for 25 or 50 or or $100, we're just looking for a dollar or 50 cents per episode from as many as you as possible, or whatever you can afford. This current season, 25, will remain just as all the others, totally free and delivered in our usual way, with an episode out roughly every fortnight. But come season 26, we'd like to be in a position of having patrons totalling a minimum of $350 per episode. If all our regular listeners gave just a few cents, then that would be covered easily. If we reach this target, then from season 26, each new release will be delivered early for our patrons, and each patron will have full and free access to our entire back catalogue, which we'll update and bring up to date in the meanwhile, which will equate to around 250 plus episodes and specials. We'd love you to find out more about our Patreon campaign, and you can do so by simply navigating to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com, forward slash the history network. And to summarise what I've said here in this intro, Angus and I have actually recorded a little video. So even if it's just for the inquisitiveness of finding out what we look like in front of a camera, then just go to patreon.com forward slash the history network and see our Patreon campaign video there as well as all the blurb on it. Thanks so much, and in the meanwhile, just sit back and enjoy the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, Season 25, Episode 1, Braddock's Defeat, Washington and the Battle of Monongahela. This episode was written by Doug Nipple. Doug is a high school physics teacher who lives a few miles outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, growing up in one of the major areas of early American history, it was only a matter of time before he became obsessively interested in it. In 1753, the governor of the colony of Virginia sent George Washington, who was a 21-year-old major in the Virginia militia, to the French Fort Le Boeuf near Lake Erie in the Ohio Valley to demand the French leave the area. This ultimatum was rejected, and Washington returned to deliver the message. 
The next year, Washington returned to the Ohio Valley with a small force, under orders to try and forcibly remove the French. Washington's first combat experience occurred at the Battle of Jumonville Glen, where he defeated a small group of French who were on a diplomatic mission. In this controversial battle, the French should have been accorded peaceful passage due to their intended purpose of delivering a message to the English leadership. Due to a language barrier, misinterpretation and some say the duplicity of certain native guides, almost the entire French mission was wiped out. The native leader, the half-king, Tanner Carrison, scalping the French commander after they had surrendered. One French soldier survived the Dumontville Glen encounter and was able to make his way back to Fort Duquesne, the centre of French power in the area, reporting the massacre. The French dispatched a large force to drive the English out and perhaps take a little vengeance. In preparation, Washington had built a small stockade, which he called Fort Necessity, surrounded by trenches in a field called the Great Meadows. The French surrounded the fort, and on a rainy night in July 1754, they forced the English to surrender. Washington unwittingly signed a document on that dark night, admitting to assassinating the French commander at Dumontville Glen weeks ago. The next day, July the 4th, the English marched out of Fort Necessity. Washington had failed to remove the French from the Ohio Valley and suffered his first loss in battle. He desperately wanted a commission in the regular British army, not just the colonial militia, but the loss at Great Meadows and the surrender document he signed did not make this prospect seem at all possible. A year later, in 1755, British Major General Edward Braddock arrived in Virginia. He had been appointed as commander of forces in North America and had a comprehensive plan for a multi-front offensive against the French. This included attacks on the Great Lakes area and the Ohio Valley. Braddock would personally command the attack into the Ohio Valley in an attempt at conquering Fort Duquesne. Major General Edward Braddock was born in Scotland in 1695 and joined his father's command, the Coldstream Guards, at the age of 15. He was promoted through the ranks and by the age of 58 was a colonel in the 14th Regiment of Foot. At 59 he became a Major General and was given command of the British forces in North America. Braddock's plan was to complete the road that Washington started on his expedition the previous year. Through a hundred miles of wilderness from Fort Cumberland in Maryland on the Potomac River to Fort Duquesne, modern-day Pittsburgh. He would then lay siege to and conquer the French-held fort. For the expedition, Braddock commanded the 44th and 48th Regiments of Foot, and some British American regulars, totalling over 2,000 men. A lot of the leadership in this encounter would be prominent in the American Revolution on both sides of that conflict. Officers such as Thomas Gage, Charles Lee, Horatio Gates and George Washington, as well as the officers and enlisted men, there were many wagoneers and frontiersmen who were paid to haul supplies some of these included men that would also become famous in the upcoming years, Daniel Boone and Daniel Morgan, to name a couple. Washington viewed the upcoming Braddock expedition as a tremendous opportunity. He repeatedly requested a commission and a place on the upcoming expedition. He was not awarded the commission in the British Army, but received a volunteer aide-de-camp position. His familiarity with the area and previous encounters with the French earned him the militia rank of captain for the expedition. In various conversations with Braddock and his staff, Washington warned the other British officers about trying to fight European style. 
men in lines firing volleys was not effective against the native tribes whose style was to fire from cover and shoot officers and leadership first braddock and many of the officers brushed off these warnings at this time benjamin franklin was the postmaster general of the colonies he went and met with braddock about the correct handling of dispatches and ended up being a supplier of wagons and rations for the mission during their meetings braddock claimed that conquering fort duquesne wouldn't take long when franklin warned him of the tenacity and fighting skills of the native americans he was dismissed by braddock's bragging of the superiority of british arms and troops both the french and the english had native american tribes allied with them the french more effectively than the british when braddock met with his native allies at the start of the campaign they asked about the land that the british intended to take and use in the ohio valley braddock responded that it all would belong to the king this both insulted and frightened the natives they were beginning to read between the lines about the true intentions of the english all of the native warriors left afterwards due to braddock's brashness he had lost several hundred fighting men who had important knowledge of the area and impeccable scouting skills the expedition proceeded at an excruciating slow pace most days only two or three miles were covered as they constructed the road hundreds of men would use axes and trenching tools to clear the road while hundreds would stand guard the completion of the road was a priority because braddock intended to occupy fort duquesne after he conquered it using it as the focus for british presence in the ohio valley the road was to be the means of resupply for the fort which would serve as a base from which to move up the allegheny river and conquer fort le Buff on lake erie and fort niagara on lake ontario this would put him into a position to link with the other british army that would be attacking up the st lawrence river after weeks of construction and eventually passing the ruins of fort necessity braddock felt the expedition was moving too slowly he hurried forward with a flying column of about fifteen hundred men leaving behind the supply train would allow him to make better time reaching and taking the fort on the way to the fort due to geographic features the column was forced to cross the monongahela river twice a wide meandering river an advance column of three hundred men and some cannon under thomas gage separated from the column after the second fording of the river the native allies of the french had informed them of the approach of the british advanced column the french troops at fort duquesne hastily mounted a mission to attack the incoming advanced column since they wouldn't be able to withstand a siege with multiple english cannon there was a lengthy debate among the french command as to whether they should abandon the fort or fight they decided to try and fight the english before they arrived and laid siege the french commander gave permission to captain beaujeu to attack the english as they approached he convinced the native allies to fight with him and his smaller french contingent by wearing native dress and rallying them with an impressive speech they were hoping to ambush the english at the river but unbeknownst to them had now missed the opportunity they were about eight hundred men on the french mission over six hundred were native allies later that morning july ninth the two forces ran directly into each other the french thinking the british hadn't yet crossed the river some accounts say that the french set an ambush captain beaujeu the french commander was killed early in the encounter perhaps in the first volley from the british many of the french regular troops broke and fled at the loss of their leader just as the british attack was gaining momentum the french native allies swept into both flanks firing into the british lines from cover the british were still in ranks firing without cover and started to take casualties from the heavy musketry of the natives 
Gage and his advanced column of men fell back and ran directly into the rest of the British column that had been left behind, who had been hurrying forward to assist in the fighting. The road was very narrow and the area heavily forested. At that time the area was ancient forest, home to huge trees that several men could hide behind. These trees also served to block most of the sunlight reaching the forest floor. They were now compacted together. The smoke from thousands of muskets choked the air and made visibility difficult. Officers were trying to reform ranks for volley fire. In doing so, they were made targets of themselves for the natives, who were above them on a ridge and behind cover, firing at red uniforms. Washington argued to have men fire from cover, but was overruled. The British were becoming more and more confused in the smoke and cramped conditions. Casualties and fear were mounting. The natives started to completely encircle the British and continued the heavy fire into their lines from the tree cover. Braddock was wounded, along with most of the officers, as the natives targeted men on horseback or any soldier with a distinguishing uniform. Over 70% of the British officers were wounded or killed on this day, leaving their men leaderless and in a terrible situation. The British finally started to break and began a panicked retreat that Washington referred to as like sheep before the hounds. Washington behaved bravely and was, in fact, called the hero of Monongahela. He is credited with saving the remainder of the troops, moving among them and trying to rally a counter-attack. He eventually organised a rear action that allowed the survivors to retreat and cross the river and make their way back to the supply column. He was also able to evacuate the wounded Braddock across the river. Washington later wrote in his journal that he had at least a dozen musket ball holes in his coat at the end of the battle. At the end of the day, out of 1,300 men, the British lost over 900 killed or wounded. The French and natives lost 40 or 50 killed or wounded out of about 800. It is one of the worst defeats of the British army in the 18th century. On July 13th, General Braddock died of his wounds. Washington buried him in the middle of the road he was building near the Great Meadows and remnants of Fort Necessity. He had the army march over the grave to hide the location so it wouldn't be disturbed or desecrated. Washington later wrote of Braddock, Thus died a man whose good and bad qualities were intimately blended. Before he died, Braddock presented Washington with his red officer's sash. Washington retained possession as a treasured keepsake. Eventually, the sash made its way to other owners, but can still be viewed on occasion at Washington's home, Mount Vernon. Braddock's body was discovered in 1804 by a crew working on the road. Unfortunately, some of the remains were kept as souvenirs by the crew. Some even were purchased by P. T. Barnum. An effort was made to recover the remains and inter them respectfully. The current monument at the site was constructed to the side of U.S. Route 40 in 1913 with contributions by Braddock's unit, the Coldstream Guards, a small distance away from the grave site and is maintained by the National Park Office. As the retreat continued, Washington ordered that food stashes be left hidden on roadside for the stragglers and wounded who weren't with the main group so that they might have some sustenance. Four days later, the main group of survivors made their way into Fort Cumberland. The next British attack on Fort Duquesne wouldn't occur for three more years. Well, don't forget to check out what we're intending to do from season 26 onwards by going to patreon.com forward slash the history network links at the website and we'll keep you updated through the Facebook page as well as to how all that is going. Thanks so much for listening. You've been listening to the history network dot org podcast written by Doug Nipple read by Nick Barker.